The Hanged King. The SCP universe often wears its Lovecraftian influences on its sleeve, filled with cosmic horrors indifferent to humanity. Some of the references are perhaps more blatant than others, such as The Hanged King and its connection to The King in Yellow by Robert Chambers. The Hanged King is another mysterious alien entity in a universe that already has its fair share, but that doesn't make it less interesting. The Hanged King is not as widespread across the SCP wiki as, say, the Scarlet King, as it's only featured in a few SCPs so far, so I'll go into as much detail as I can. The Hanged King was first introduced in SCP-701, nearly ten years ago at this point. 701 is a Caroline-era revenge tragedy play, titled The Hanged King's Tragedy, taking place across five acts. The first known publication of the play is dated 1640, with no known author, and no other information can be found about it. It was reprinted again by unknown individuals in 1733, 1790, 1813, 1965, and 1971, sometimes under different names, and sometimes it's been simply photocopied and passed around universities. Performances of SCP-701 cause an outbreak of psychotic and suicidal behavior in both performers and observers, in addition to other strange events roughly 36.78% of the time. The majority of performances do not result in any anomalous behavior, but SCP-701 is nonetheless believed to be responsible for at least 10,000 and likely many more deaths since its original publication. In those cases where 701 affects the performance, the timeline of events generally follows a consistent pattern. One to two weeks before the opening night, cast members will begin to deviate from the published text during dress rehearsals. These deviations will be less like improvisations and more like the performers are collectively working off of a different script. No one will be aware that anything has changed, believing that the play has run that way since the start. The actual event will occur either on opening night of the play or at whatever performance of the play will result in the greatest attendance. In the final scene of Act 1, a mysterious hooded individual will begin to appear on stage, usually in the background, and will sometimes seem to walk off stage, but will simply disappear before it goes backstage. None of the cast or crew will remark on the individual's presence. In Act 5 of the play, the event will culminate as the hooded individual is incorporated into the play. The cast will proceed to murder each other, or commit suicide, sometimes with objects that have spontaneously appeared on stage, and rioting will break out in the audience, leading to a bloodbath. If any audience members survive, they will likely leave the theater, but continue to commit random acts of violence. If they survive for 24 hours, their personalities will return to normal, but many will be traumatized and some rendered comatose. So, we have some sort of mimetic play that makes people suicidally violent, but to learn more about the Hanged King himself, let's look at a summary of the contents of the play. The play seems to be set perhaps in 14th century Italy, but many aspects of the setting are clearly fantastical. The play begins after the death of a king, supposedly due to natural causes, and now his younger brother, who has married his brother's widow, is to be crowned. During the coronation, the drunk queen privately admits to some of her attendants that the king did not die in his sleep, but instead he was murdered by both herself and his brother. As a final show of disrespect, the deceased king was hanged from a tree like a common criminal. She also admits that a visiting minor noble is actually the son of the dead king, making him the rightful heir. The son, Antonio, later receives a visit from the ghost of the king, who confirms the queen's story. The new king finds out about the queen's drunken confession, and learns that three others heard it as well, a duke, the duke's daughter, and a priest. He proceeds to lock up the queen in a convent, claiming that she has gone mad, 
and begins to plan to deal with the three others. Meanwhile, Antonio begins to plot revenge against the current king and queen. The king has the duke killed and his corpse placed in a stew, and has the duke's daughter also locked up in a convent. Antonio heads to the convent to kill the queen, who is warned of his coming, and plans to murder him using poison. Antonio sees through the plan and forces the queen to drink the poison instead, killing her. The king has received a powerful poison from the ambassador of Alagada, an unknown kingdom we'll discuss more later, and plans to poison the stew he's made from the duke's corpse, feeding it to the court to cover up the truth. As the banquet begins, Antonio appears in the palace with a signed confession from the king's co-conspirator, providing details on the hanged king's murder and the cover-up, as well as proof on Antonio's lineage. The king is deposed, Antonio takes the throne, and all is well. This is the structure of the play as written, but when an SCP-701 event occurs, a number of deviations will appear in the performance. Most of the deviations revolve around the mysterious kingdom of Alagada, including nodding to the hooded individual as the ambassador of Alagada. More focus is put on the tribute that the king owes Alagada, and in the one transcript we have of an event, the actor playing the king is hanged and eviscerated on stage. The actor playing Antonio then says, With this, the tribute, in full it is paid. With this, fool's blood, it is the hanged king's. The king's throat is then slit, followed by the rest of the cast hanging themselves from ropes, as one of them says, With this, our blood, it is the hanged king's. This is then followed by chaos amongst the audience. SCP-701 is clearly inspired by the book, The King in Yellow, by Robert Chambers, which in turn inspired H.P. Lovecraft and August Derleth, leading to the current connection between the King in Yellow and the Great Old One, Haster, within the Cthulhu Mythos. The King in Yellow features multiple short stories connected by a mysterious play that drives a reader mad, particularly if they are artistic. The play is a multi-act story involving a noble court in a faraway place, in this case an alien world, and the presence of a mysterious stranger visiting the court. At the climax of the play, during a masked ball, the stranger is told to remove his mask when he reveals that he is not wearing one. The book reveals very little of the actual text of the play, although other authors have attempted to recreate it, such as More Light by James Blish. In the original book, reading the play forces more of an obsessive madness over an individual than a violent rage, although later versions, such as in the Tatters of the King module for the Call of Cthulhu RPG, do feature something much closer to SCP-701's effect. That's all well and good, but we're really not much closer to figuring out what the Hanged King actually is, other than a subject of a cursed play. We're going to have to look a little deeper then, specifically at SCP-2264, an extra-dimensional city called, as you might have guessed, Alagada. The entrance to Alagada, or at least one of the entrances, is an iron door in a hidden chamber beneath Martin Tower, part of the Tower of London. The only way to open this door is through an alchemical process, and it's believed that the door was created by Henry Percy, 9th Earl of Northumberland, who was imprisoned in the Tower of London for many years due to suspicion that he knew about the gunpowder plot against King James I, but did nothing about it. He was also known as the Wizard Earl, partly due to his interest in scientific and alchemical experiments. SCP-2264 states that his journal discusses the four alchemical stages of the magnum opus, the process by which an alchemist would create a philosopher's stone, capable of turning base metals into gold or silver. Apparently, the Foundation has a Department of Alchemical Studies, and after following the process outlined in the journal, they were able to open the door. 
Anyone who passes through the door into the realm of Alagada will find all of their belongings missing, and their clothing replaced with an outfit similar to those worn at masquerade balls, specifically those associated with the Carnival of Venice. Agents have reported that the outfits feel somewhat organic, describing it as chitinous, and although the clothes can be removed while inside of Algada, for some reason the masks cannot be. The most common inhabitants of Alagada are described as roughly humanoid, and typically wear the same style of outfits. Alagada possesses a yellow sky dotted with an indeterminate amount of black stars corresponding to no known or hypothesized constellations. Again, this is likely a reference to a stanza in the King in Yellow play reading, Strange is the night where black stars rise, and strange moons circle through the skies, but stranger still is lost Carcosa. Buildings seem to have been carved from a single seamless material, utilizing impossible architecture, and inhabitants routinely break the laws of gravity, such as by climbing upside down staircases. Black, white, yellow, and red are the only colors that are seen in Alagada, and the city is described as having the odor of dried flowers with a hint of mold, or something like the scent of old books. Additionally, although the size of the city has been difficult to measure, it has been confirmed that the city is located on an island surrounded by a black ocean. Individuals visiting the city have trouble estimating time and space while inside of it, although those with a history of lucid dreaming have shown far greater self-control and attention to detail. Apparently, it's easy for someone who enters to get addicted to the city, and most of those that do manage to make it out have trouble explaining what they experienced. A Foundation doctor experienced with both hallucinogenics and lucid dreaming is sent in to properly examine the city. The other agents sent with him quickly succumb to the decadent pleasures that the city has to offer, but the doctor avoids this and soldiers on. He discovers that there is a universal translation of languages well within Alagada, as although the other agents hear everything in English, he hears in his native Spanish. Written words don't translate quite as easily as it seems the native script of Alagada is quite alien, and there are some words that don't have an equivalent in human language. They also met with another foreign visitor and fellow scholar, the Wandsman of Colmanus, who informed him that the city was called Alagada, and it was located on the border of Nevermint. The Wandsman wore a beaked mask and exquisite robes, and their hands were scaly with black talons. The Wandsman showed the Doctor a scroll displaying a map of the multiverse, presented as layers and layers of endless spirals, which only served to give the Doctor a migraine. The Wandsman went on to explain the power structure of Alagada, saying to avoid the powerful entities at all costs. The Doctor, based on the descriptions, believes they could be quite dangerous reality benders. There are four masked lords that directly oversee Alagada. The Black Lord, wearer of the Anguished Mask. The White Lord, wearer of the Diligent Mask. The Yellow Lord, wearer of the Odious Mask. And the Red Lord, wearer of the Mirthful Mask. Each is said to be terrible, although the Black Lord was the victim of a political struggle some time ago, and was exiled to a dreadful dimensional backwater. This backwater is, of course, our dimension, and the Lord is now contained by the Foundation as SCP-035. The Wandsman goes on to say that the four Lords serve as advisors to the King of Alagada, and most visitors come to the city seeking a boon from the King. The Wandsman spoke very little of the King, and also suggested the Doctor avoid the Ambassador of Alagada as well. The Doctor later makes a second trip into the city, hoping to find the Wandsman again, searching the massive palace library for him. They eventually find him, 
but the Wandsman informs them that the Ambassador will soon return after visiting the city of Aditum, which he describes as a terrible city filled with equally terrible people. Aditum was the Davite city-state that was overthrown by the first Sarkites, and is generally regarded as a holy kingdom for them. The Wandsman mentions that it is said that the Grand Karsist of Aditum serves an elder being that could rival even the hanged king of Alagada, which would be Yaldaboth. Changing the subject, the Wandsman describes himself as a scholar and walker of the astral plane, a sailor of the celestial sea, and a spelunker of the planar deep. He admits that there is something strange about the Doctor's aura, but he has encountered others with similar auras. He mentions the deathless merchants of London, driven by greed and black ambition, which would be Marshall, Carter, and Dark. Also, there was a stranger in a strange land smelling of fear that looked as if they didn't know where they were, and vanished just as suddenly as they had appeared. This would be the Foundation's own Dimension Hopper, SCP-507. It seems also that other Sarkites made their way to Alagada, reeking of decay and embryonic fluid. At this point, the Ambassador returns, and the Wandsman suggests the Doctor flees immediately back home. The O5 Council votes to send in a mobile task force, Psi-9 Abyss Gazers, in order to find the Ambassador and the King, and determine the level of threat they represented to humanity. Twelve agents were sent in, and one returned alive. We're given a transcript of an interview with the survivor, who is in critical condition upon return. The agent begins by saying how remarkable the city was, words failing to do it justice. The MTF had no info about what their targets looked like or how to locate them, and so they began by finding the palace. The agents described their trek through the city as blurry, with everything following a sort of dream logic. The details were hard to focus on, even at the time but they noted a number of individuals engaging in sexual pleasures, many of them being natives. He said their skin was like porcelain, but the more you focused on them, the less human they seemed, some with too many limbs, and some with too few. One of the agents had to be pulled away from a native, who was described as having curves in all the right places, making it easy to ignore the tentacles. Wandering the Labyrinthine Palace, they spent most of their time descending stairs, and just as they thought they had reached the bottom, they were outside again, looking at the palace in the distance. The difference was that everything was dark now, drained of color in a hazy, gray twilight. The streets were now empty, and the city looked ruined. They re-entered the palace, and began to hear whispers inside of their heads, in a language they had never heard before. They then encountered the Ambassador, an entity with no face, with what looked like a skin-tight outfit and high heels, but this was actually its body. The agent says that it stood so damn proud, radiating arrogance, and even though the agent couldn't understand what it was saying, he could tell that it was narcissistic. It proceeded to laugh as the agents were forced to savagely harm their own bodies for its amusement, breaking their bones and rupturing their organs. They screamed the entire time, begging for mercy, but no sound left their lips. It seems the ambassador sent back one survivor in order to send a message. The agent was taken to the throne of the Hanged King and I'll take the time to read what he saw verbatim. There I saw the king. It was anchored in place, hollowed bonds around its corpse-like hands and throat, its face hidden beneath a veil. Impish creatures crawled all over it, caressing its twitching body as if intending comfort while others pulled the tethers even tighter. The king trembled and quivered, and I saw pale tendrils slither in and out of its tattered robes. I looked on as the veil was lifted. 
the agent stops to beg the interviewer to kill him because he can't live with what he's done. But the interviewer just asks him to say what he saw under the veil. The agent says, A God-shaped hole. The barren desolation of a fallen and failed creation. You see the light of long-dead stars. Your existence is nothing but an echo of a dying god's screams. The unseen converges, surrounds you, and it tightens like a noose. The agent's request for termination was denied, and his arms and legs had to be amputated due to damage. He's currently on life support, being interrogated and monitored due to his contact with the ambassador and the king. An unsent letter was found among Henry Percy's notes that was addressed to Christopher Marlowe, famed poet and playwright. It seems that Henry and Christopher had visited Alagada, and Christopher was influenced by the ambassador to write a cursed play about the Hanged King, SCP-701. Henry urges Christopher in the letter to burn the accursed play, but Christopher was murdered before the letter could be sent. Well, we certainly have some more information now. The Hanged King is an eldritch entity that is apparently on the same level as Yaldabaoth, and rules over an extra-dimensional city accessible by an unknown amount of other dimensions. It would seem, though, that the Hanged King is bound to his throne, and the active rulers of Algada are the Ambassador and the Four Masked Lords. The Ambassador influences artistic people into creating material about the Hanged King, spreading his influence, just like the King in Yellow. To learn more about the Hanged King's backstory, we'll have to look to a tale titled, And So the Crows Laughed. While there's no canon in the SCP universe, this tale presents a unique and interesting take on the creation of such a terrible entity. The tale presents a kingdom under revolt, the peasants storming the palace and dragging the king out into the streets. They placed heavy rusted chains around him and covered him in rags, breaking his bones in the process. His followers and servants were butchered, the court jester beheaded as his mask lay broken on the ground. The palace was looted of all of its treasure by the raging mob, but the wiser men of the city, the scholars and artists, fled the kingdom instead, knowing what the things in the palace dungeon meant. They knew that the king did more than just torture out of corruption and indulgence, but he followed something much darker, something that shouldn't be remembered. The tomes and symbols reminded them of the ancient gods of the abyss, and it was clear to them that the king sacrificed not just his own soul, but the souls of those around him. A lion, once the king's pet, was now just a skeleton covered in carvings that they could not unsee, and the king's soldiers fell easily to the mob because it was as if something had sucked the life out of them over the years. Meanwhile, the mob cheers in delight as the king is dragged through the streets on broken knees, mumbling unholy words through his broken jaw. The king is taken to a hill where an old tree stood so that they could hang him like a common criminal, nameless and forgotten. They cursed and spat at him, but no one would dare look in his eyes, trying to hide the unsettling feeling in their hearts and minds as the filthy king continues to mumble things that they did not want to hear. As the king was hanged, heavy chains still around his body, he spoke inhuman words that came from dark places, and then laughed until his final breath. The cheering died down, and the people, not wishing to gaze upon the hanged king for a second more, fled the hill quickly, as it seemed as if his laughter still echoed. Crows eventually came to the hill, circling around the hanged king, laughing all the while. The people had intended to leave the king there until his body decayed, but the lifeless look of the king was so resentful and disgusting that everyone wanted to bury him beneath the earth. 
They buried him as shallow as they could, for no one wanted to stay long enough to dig a deeper hole. And they went back to their lives, hoping to forget what they had witnessed. On the first day, a homeless man reported hearing strange noises coming from the hill, and crows had gathered around the king's grave. He was dismissed as a madman. On the second day, many residents of the city found themselves ill, coughing, bleeding, and trembling on the floor as if they were bound by heavy, rusted chains. The river that flowed through the city ran red, smelling of blood, and many died. Those that survived to the third day found themselves able to move again, but they were caught in a madness, slicing their own throats or ripping their faces off. Blood streamed out of houses, and all the animals except for the crows fled the city, the crows silently watching the madness. The crows on the hilltop laughed as the hanged king rustled in his grave and climbed out, chains still around him and the rope around his neck. He had bargained the souls of his people to avoid the path of death, and he made his way back to his palace. He made his way into his dungeon, where he stepped up to a throne covered in sharp, rusted spikes. The king sat on the throne, the spikes impaling his dead body and his soul. This was his rightful throne, but he was there to suffer forever. The palace began to shake, the city trembled, and the skeleton of the lion stood up and roared. The city turned inside out, along with everything inside of it, bending space and time. The city and its inhabitants were now in another place, transformed and remade into something twisted and inhuman. The dead jester, wearing his broken mask, approached the king with a silver cup filled with blood. He offered the cup to the king, speaking words that weren't quite his, saying, With this, our blood, it is the hanged king's. The king's hand was too weak to hold the cup, however, and it shattered on the floor. The crows laughed with their harsh voices and left the city as the dead stood up again, putting on masks to cover their ripped faces. The people began to cheer, parading through the city and starting a carnival, laughing as the king silently screamed. And so the city is ruled forever by the hanged king, while the masked dead celebrate and parade until they rot. Those that had fled the city, the scholars and artists, did not find peace, however. They were haunted both in waking moments and in dreams, with whispers from the twisted city. They were given visions of the hanged king's court and his cursed city, and the thoughts took root in their minds. They would go on to write dramas and poems, composing songs or paintings of what they had seen, and those that would view them would come within the Hanged King's reach. If we accept this tale then, the Hanged King was not a primordial entity of eldritch horror, but was instead just a king. We don't know where this kingdom was located, or whether it was our Earth or another version of Earth, but the king's dealings with some sort of dark gods eventually created the extra-dimensional city of Alagada. The tale doesn't really discuss the nature of the ambassador, but masks are clearly important, and it's possible that the jester is one of the four lords. Perhaps the ambassador plays a similar role to the modern take on the king in yellow, a physical avatar of the great old one Haster that can operate where Haster cannot go. Alternatively, perhaps the Hanged King is indeed nothing more than a prisoner, and the Ambassador is the only godlike power that rules Alagada. Perhaps the Hanged King ushered forth a god, leaving him as nothing more than a god-shaped hole. Ultimately, we're again left with far more questions than answers, and although there are other tales that go into a bit further detail on Alagada and the Hanged King, I think it's best if I leave off here. The homages to the King in Yellow, Haster, and Carcosa are all pretty clear in SCP-701, The Hanged King, and Alagada, respectively, 
but they make interesting additions to the SCP universe. There's far less material on the Hanged King compared to similar entities such as the Scarlet King, but time will tell if SCP writers can mold a truly great story out of the Shackled God.